Thank you. It is 4.59. Welcome to the council meeting for Monday, May 11th, 2020. As you can tell by the room layout, there's been some adjustments made here to uh, safely accommodate all of us uh, as council and a couple of directors as well. So thank you for seeing that that was organized. CAO Gowdy, we appreciate it. I will call the meeting to order for tonight. With respect to the agenda, does anybody have any changes there they'd like us to consider? I have a minor item, Mayor Creasy. It's uh, just simply page 34 is a deletion. It's just a spurious duplication of page 36 on the PDF, uh, just in case there's any confusion. That was the item that appeared twice in the agenda that's, package? That's correct. It's, it's a duplicate <laughs> Very page good. We that. For those of you watching at home, that is our legislative coordinator who is not in the, in the room. He's joining us electronically. We appreciate your help, Ross. Thank and you. We will make note of that uh, extra page. Um, Councillor Hibbs? I will move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you very much. We'll see the changes. <coughs> All those in favor? Thank you very much. So <coughs> we're joined tonight uh, electronically by uh, two members of the Lacombe Regional Tourism uh, Board. We've got uh, our the chair, Mary uh, Ketchell. Thank you for joining us. You can hear us okay, very well. And we've also got the executive director, Angel Han. Are you able to hear us, Angel? You bet. Very good. I understand that you've got uh, a presentation for us. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. So do you have a hard copy of the presentation with you? No. Okay, so I'm going to flip over so that I can go through the presentation as you're looking at it. If you have any questions, just yell because I'm going to be looking at the presentation, not at you guys. So this is a little bit about how we want to look at Lacombe Regional Tourism going forward. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you where we are now and what we want to do for the future. So first, some goals for what we want for Lacombe County Tourism. So we want to create a top of mind awareness of Lacombe for people who may not see us as a tourism destination. We also want to facilitate cooperative marketing opportunities between the different municipalities and the county as well as business entities. We also want to improve the awareness of the impact and purpose of image marketing and to promote and support the further development of all areas of tourism, including agritourism, ecotourism, rural tourism, foods, arts, culture, basically everything. So currently our focus is twofold. We have frontline services at the Flatiron Building. Angel is there uh, most every day, especially September through June, and seven days a week, July and August. We have um, 268 fully serviced days currently. We also do a lot of marketing and event planning with website maintenance, um, with over 90,000 digital visitors per year, promotion of area events and businesses via social media. Um, you may notice that we've really upped our game on Facebook and uh, Instagram, especially during the current uh, COVID crisis. Um, we also assist with area events like Light Up the Night, Lacombe Days, and full coordination of Culture and Harvest Festival and the Canada Day festivities. So that's where we are currently. And we want to do a big nod tip to Angel and her team because we're not here to say we need to change things because things aren't currently working. They are. Lacombe has been recognized as being a leader in tourism activities in Alberta. 
And we don't want to change that. We just want to figure out a way to be even better. So some of the questions that our team has been thinking about is who are we trying to attract to the Lacombe region? Where are they? Um, how do we reach them? And what do we have to offer them? And are we currently reaching those people how we do things today? What if we hit the road and took Lacombe to them? So one of the things that we're looking at is perhaps a mobile Lacombe experience to hit the road. So with the mobile Lacombe tourism van, we could go where the tourists are. Community events in surrounding areas in central Alberta, as well as Calgary, Edmonton, suburbs and outlying communities. We could support additional communities in Lacombe County outside of Lacombe proper and visibly be seen with brand recognizable imaging, even when we're driving. We can promote our regional strengths, which is that we're family friendly. We're very budget conscious which is very different from some of our larger CD counterparts. We're close to home. We have a lot to offer that for just about anybody. It's not just a sports town. It's not just a food town. We have everything. There's really something for everyone. So how do we pivot? Because right now we do support tourists, but the tourists kind of have to find us before we support them. They need, to be able, they need to be wanting to look at our website or come into the Flatiron Building with, once they're already in town. With the new mobile unit, we would be able to go to them before they even think about coming to us. So how do we pivot? The first is to let go of the high cost Flatiron Building lease. We would then procure a lower cost office space, purchase the Lacombe Tourism mobile unit, draft a plan for events to target for summer 2021, move hours spent face-to-face -face at the Flatiron to flexible hours spent where the tourists are, while continuing to support local and regional events, festivals, the website, and social media. So basically the goal would be to take our current program services and online marketing and increase the face-to-face -face contact to promote low home region to those who haven't currently seen home as a destination instead of those who are already here. So here's some of the growth potentials, as you can imagine, bringing new visitors, broadening our outreach, um, promoting more of Lacombe County attractions and events, further improve our position as a tourism leader in Alberta, increase uh, Lacombe, <laughs> Lacombe Regional Partnership Marketing Opportunities, create cross-promotion -pr opportunities with visiting uh, communities via blogging and post sharing, and visibly be seen brand recognition throughout the region and province. And as always, drive uh, more business to our regional businesses. So you're probably asking, how much is this going to cost? Well, we've looked at it from a new purchase perspective, and we think that we could get into a new cargo van that's set up how we need it for a total of $50,649 off the top. We could do a used unit, which could save some money, but for ease, we've just put it as a new one for right now, just to run through the numbers. We also looked at the lifespan of seven years so that we would put an annual reserve back to make sure that at the end of seven years, we would be in a position to buy a new van as opposed to just being stuck with an old one. And annual operating costs would be about $5,910 per year. So over seven years, we're looking at a cost of $127,000 $649. So where would that money come from? Well, if we get rid of the flat iron lease, currently we're paying about 30,000 a year. That includes utilities, but does not include phone and internet. So seven years of that is $210,000. 
We are required to pay a five month penalty if we break the lease. It's approximately $12,000 to get out of that lease. However, we would immediately change to a non public facing space, which we could get for about $1,000 a month. That's a savings of $18,000 a year. So we've broken that down by year to show that over the seven year time, we could do a net savings of $116,000 just by changing our lease. So this goes a long way being able to afford the mobile unit that we are looking at. So there's some current market examples of used vehicle options. Um, we just threw those on there in there so you can see that you know there are different ways that we could do this. Our timeline would be that we give our notice to vacate the Flatiron building on November 1st. We would move into a new lower cost office space November 30th and then in January we would hit the ground running to purchase and prepare the mobile unit um, so that we could get it all customized and ready to go in time for a summer 2021 rollout. So our budget ask for 2021 is kind of twofold. Historically, the Flatiron lease and utilities were handled separately from operational funding. So while we spent that money, it wasn't in the same bucket as traditional uh, money for our reasons. So we want to know if there is a moose, how would the City and County of Lacombe see handling these expenditures going forward because those decisions will determine our updated budget ask for 2021. Can we take money from the bucket for the lease and move it over to use it for a mobile van? That's the crux of the question. We've put together some uh, examples of other mobile units that people are using to do tourism and selling and all kinds of things currently so this isn't a brand new idea but it is very new especially for tourism in Alberta. so um this the last slide is a eye chart for the 2020 budget believe me it just shows what i just said and then our board of directors uh look home regional tourism that's just who we are and that is all so if you have any questions let me click back over so I can see you. Did I go too fast? Well, that was good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I, <coughs> uh, so then the, this obviously has went through the uh, board at this point and was met with overwhelming support, I expect. Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to, wanted to be sure of that. I guess with the, as far as the numbers go, so you're you're expecting or uh, to have a space secured for a thousand dollars a month, including utilities. Yes, actually, um, we've been in talks with the Lacombe Performing Arts Center, and they have um, office space there, which they're willing to lease to us. And it's actually less than $1,000, but because it's just office space, we're going to have to rent a storage unit for things like our visitor guides and tents and all of the different equipment we wouldn't have room for. But we are confident we can keep it under $1,000 a month. Well, renting storage is what we'd like to promote for sure. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Any questions? Councillor Hoekstra? So on page 11, you um, have the whole budget for the mobile van, um, the whole budget estimate. I missed what the $35,000 was. Unless, this, sure. like it says 50,000 for the van, 35 plus yeah. 42. The, uh, the difference is in the cost of the van, which is 45,000, and then the estimated resell of the unit after seven years, we still figure we can maybe get about $10,000. So $35,000 is the amount that we broke down over seven years to put in reserve to buy a new one. Okay. 
Gotcha. That makes sense. And then the 42,000 is the, the 6,000 for the, okay, got it. Yes, it makes sense now. No We're hoping to keep it in, in really good shape so that it has a, a good resale value as well when we upgrade. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Casey. Uh, <clears throat> I don't see a budget allowance for example, when you attend major events, are they not going to charge you for that space? So, you know, like. Yeah. You yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And some are depending on what we do. Um, that's sort of kind of a bit of the cross promotion that we hope to do with some of the communities. Um, you know, like if they kind of let us pull in and park and Thank be a part Mayor of what's Casey. going uh, on, then we are promoting them as well as promoting ourselves. And we can use it to an advantage for both space. when we're doing our so social really media like campaigns. Um, yeah, yeah and question. even talking yeah. with some of the different oh, communities and that uh, we work with on the Central Alberta um, Tourism Alliance sort of Board, the they uh, agreed that they thought that was a, a really good idea um, and welcomed and us like to come in and join, pull in and park and like join in on that. their events and then promote both the Palm and Central Alberta. We are promoting them as well as promoting ourselves. Councilor Gullick, thank you, Mayor Creasy. Yeah, I want to say that I like this idea. But I just want to have a question regarding the Flatiron Building and the participation you got from the public coming in the doors. Just to give some numbers. Uh, do you have numbers from last year, for example? Because I know visits to tourism booths and so on have been way down because people are using their iPhones and different things. And you're probably in a similar situation, I would think. Right. Well, and a lot of the like we're we're such a I guess a mixed bag at the Flatiron. Um, there is a certain sector that come in for tourist information, but like Mary um, said, they're already in the comb. They've already come here, um, and a lot of people just want to come into the building because it's an attraction. It's beautiful. They want to see it. Um, some come in for local information. It's really um, mixed and not saying that it is an asset, but it just requires like of our number of hours that we have to promote the cult tourism. We're spending a huge chunk of that being tied to the building and not being able to go out. Um, if we had the extra money in our budget to keep frontline services, it would you know, definitely it's really be a different option. Uh, but um, even with the Flatiron being for sale, has also thrown it just that into the mix as we don't really have control over that aspect of the space. So we just really tried to look at it from a whole, uh, whole picture. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me for our stats, um, but I can get them to you guys definitely. But um, even with I don't think exact numbers are that important. It's just yeah. I think if the trend has been down to to go into those type of buildings, people are using the internet and getting the information they need from their phones and so on. That was the point of the trend. Oh. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's just interesting, like I said, because it's such a beautiful, iconic building, of course, people are drawn to come in. Um, and I mean, it does present an awesome opportunity for us to share information on the community. But yeah, you're right. They've done their research before they even come in the door most days. Yeah, and uh, the yeah, it, it is a changing, changing time for tourism. So that, that is it your expectation that uh, you, your time or staff or staff's time will be uh, no more than it is now, but it'll, rather than manning a specific space, flat iron as it is now, the more time will be spent on, the, on this mobile unit? Or is this well, in addition yeah. to? No, exactly. Um, that's always been a challenge for me at tourism because I have a sign and hours on the door, we've had to put our time into being in the Flatiron building when we should be out at festivals, going out to attractions, doing blogging and videos and stuff like that to enhance the marketing of the region rather than being frontline services. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mayor Christie. So just building a little bit on Councillor Gullickson's comments, I, my only fear with this whole plan is I think because you're downtown, tourists naturally, well, the highway's right there, of course, so tourists are going right by you. My only fear is to get off the beaten path a little bit, such as the Performing Arts Building, you might miss some of that. I get the fact that we're seeing few and fewer tourists, as Councillor Dullison alluded to, actually physically going into a tourism booth or whatever, if you will. But was there any thought to try and find something else downtown or, or no? Um, that would bring us basically back to the same position of having to allot our man hours as frontline services to answer uh, visitor information questions rather than being out in the community doing the marketing and promotion of the home tourism. Okay. So it's just, it really is um, kind of a new vision and um, you know, we recognize that in the past with the connection to the historical society and the Flatiron hosting exhibits and almost being classified as a museum put us in a different position. But now as Lacombe Marketing, um, we really wanted to promote the region rather than be responsible for having to do the frontline services. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I believe that's all the questions that we have for now. We thank you both, uh, Mary and Angel, for presenting to us. We appreciate uh, your time and effort into this, and uh, I expect we will uh, Sorry. provide some input uh, at, at a later date. Grant? Grant these Council questions Mr. that they presented us with, do we not want to answer those questions for them, or, or not uh, today? I don't know if it's appropriate to do that at this time or not. Okay. So you certainly can if you're able, but um, you may not have had an opportunity to review those questions and talk about them. Maybe you'd like to talk about them now and then um, we can bring something back for some direction at a future meeting. Yeah. Councillor Ukstra, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. So I guess I was curious about your question about that the lease and the utilities were handled separately. Where where are they listed in the 2020 budget? Like, are they a completely different number or? Um, actually, the, the lease has always been taken care of externally to our day-to-day -day operation budget. Um, I'm not sure if that was just because of the past relationships with um, historical. I'm not sure. I honestly don't have the answers for why it was set up as it was. But okay. our budget generally only reflects our operating budget and not the, the rent and lease of the building. So, may I have a follow-up question? So this van would come out of those, the money that went to the lease. But we're not seeing that, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm sure that we will have some um, additional discussion. And if there's any questions, we will certainly see that they're forwarded to you and uh, answer those questions that you put forward to us uh, at an appropriate time. So thank you both. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got uh, about five minutes left. I wonder after that presentation, perhaps we should receive that as information to make it official. So would you care to put, put forth the motion for us? Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Pistemic. Uh, most of we received the information that was presented to us as information. Thank you very much. Anything before we vote? All those in favor? And I believe that was unanimous. Our postal, thank you. <clears throat> do the next thing. Short one. Yeah, if we have five minutes, I would go to the uh, solid waste presentation options. Solid waste review presentation options. Five, five minutes. minutes. Five four. Okay. Very 
Very good. So prior to our uh, public hearing process, we'll go to the solid waste uh, review presentation options. And if I could ask uh, Director Thompson, would you care to take us through that item? Oh, yeah, for sure. So uh, for Council's information, the solid waste review is complete and um, we have um, put together the, uh, the report to, to Council. Um, we, when looking at the Council agendas in the last few meetings and looking forward to applying for Council agendas, um, they have been quite busy and quite full and uh, we are anticipating the next few being um, quite full as well. And in order to provide the, um, the time for Council to, to hear the full presentation and to consider um, consider some of the, uh, the recommendations. Um, we were wondering if uh, Council is uh, interested in, in looking at alternate presentation models for that specific item. And so the, the report before Council includes um, a couple, two options and then a couple of variants of each option. One is host a regular meeting. So we would present part one of the presentation a solid waste review presentation at the next regular council meeting uh, or at the next committee meeting. Um, or council can schedule a, uh, a special committee meeting, perhaps um, during the day or at a, di at a different time that uh, that is convenient for council or to, to hear the presentation um, ahead of time. The other advanced review options that we can offer council is that um, we can I can do a pre-recorded presentation for council's information, where I would essentially do the presentation to council in a like a webinar style, um, disseminate that to council, and um, we can come ahead of time and then come to a council meeting and you know, answer questions. And so we're spending time answering questions um, rather than uh, working on the, the actual presentation itself um, during the council meeting. Um, or alternative to that, again, is that we would uh, we could just and council the written information, the administration's report, along with the full report ahead of time, and then have uh, come to a council meeting with um, with um, just debating the debating the recommendation. <coughs> so we're looking for feedback from council. We are uh, we are recommending the pre-recorded presentation option. I think that would allow us to do a similar level of presentation we we're planning for council anyway, and uh, it does give council the opportunity to review that information ahead of time and uh, come to the next available, the next council meeting with, um, with questions from administration. Thank you, Director Thompson. I, I guess just for clarity, I was curious why the pre-recorded presentation was considered a model by itself. I, I guess I, I was just under the expectation that that would be in addition to both for us and especially for the public uh, to do regardless of when we choose to do the actual meetings. So that's so the the intent of the pre-recorded presentation would be I would um, close myself in the office, record my presentation, and, and then allow council to review that in advance of the, of the council meeting, rather than during the live council meeting. Um, we have uh, because of the, the let's say the complexity or the, the broad scope of the review. We were anticipating presenting this information over the course of three council meetings with uh, asking council for a, a recommendation on the board. <clears throat> and so each one of those presentations may be close to um, 30 minutes or an hour each. And so um, including questions and whatnot. And so the pre-recorded presentation will allow council time to review that ahead of time without spending all of that time um, in open council, which have been quite busy to begin with, and we anticipate we'll be busy over the next few council meetings as well. Very good, thank you. Councillor Hibbs? Um, so I do like the idea of the pre-recorded. I would assume, I think you mentioned it, that that would be also available then to the public as well. Would that be available to the public at the same time that it is to council, or would it be, um, would they be delayed? Like, would that become public when we are going to discuss it on the agenda. Do you know, do you understand what I mean? That would come up typically with the agenda package mm -hmm. or would it come out early um, like we would have access to? Um, I think I'd have to defer to the CAO if you uh, have any thoughts on that. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you to Director Thompson. 
That was actually a mistake that he was listed as the presenter, and I'm actually to present. So thank you for stepping in there. <laughs> uh, we had foreseen actually releasing about the same time, and that way we could actually uh, be getting questions in advance of the council meeting, and then when we presented to council, say, you know, some of the questions that we got ahead of time include these three questions, and we would uh, respond to those, and any we got from council, and that would just kind of give a, an open opportunity for both council and the public to get their questions answered. Some follow-up, Councilor Gibbs? Yes, please. Um, so, I mean, I really do like that idea. I think this is one of those things that you're going to get a lot of public input in, so that the, the you know best lead time we can give to the public to be you know right off the start involved and that I think is a really good idea. Um, I do like the idea also um, as an alternative or or together um, of a separate meeting that would just be for um, discussion like on that on that item. And the reason I say that is because you know we are live streaming things; these are public. But I think that it would be beneficial for the public to actually just be able to go to you know one video for example and just it's all about um, the solid waste audit and and none of the other typical stuff that we deal with at a meeting so I, I just would put that out there as a suggestion but but I do really really like the idea of a pre-recorded if nothing else I can listen to it a number of times and, and just really get a good um, bite on it so thank you Mary Creasy will we also be getting the written report yes yes we'll have a copy of that too sometimes. At the same time as the pre recorded. Yes, we would send you out everything. And I <clears throat> just to, to temper your expectations, this will not be a production level presentation. It will be as if Jordan is here, or Director Thompson is here, sorry, uh, through the screen. So it is going to be fairly bare bones, but the same level you've come to expect from us, I guess. Nothing more or less. <laughs> So I don't see anybody else jumping up to the floor here from my perspective. Any or all of these methodologies would be wonderful other than the three different meetings. This is a massive uh, subject and one that's important to our community and to spread it over three council meetings will be extremely disruptive and confusing for people and um, we need to have one large meeting. Certainly you doing the presentation beforehand is a wonderful idea to add to that. Um, but yeah, the over three different council meetings is definitely a non-starter for me. Anyone else? Councillor Hoekstra? May I make the motion? Floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mayor Creasy. That I would like to move that council directs administration to prepare a pre-recorded presentation and allow for questions and comments from both council and public to be received prior to council's official discussion and debate at a June council meeting. So, and just with respect to that motion, then this is at a council meeting or a or an, another meeting, a specific meeting. Could we just rephrase that motion as a council slash committee meeting? That's up to the mover. <coughs> I guess I'd still like it at a, a council meeting. So it'll we'll take the whole meeting. Hopefully. Yeah, so a standalone special council meeting just for this, outside of the dates we have? Yes. Oh. I went by the motion that was part of the memo, and it says a June council meeting. So you feel. Yeah. But we, can we make another motion? If she makes that, then we need to make a motion for have something to get us another meeting anyway, don't we? You would, yes. Yes, so that works. Oh, as lightly as I can, I'm suggesting <laughs> consensus here for a special alternative meeting. If you choose to change it, that's your prerogative. If you just don't leave it as is, please say so now. It does say a uh, June council meeting. So oh. isn't that open for another council meeting being? It does not say... Any a scheduled June council meeting is am I correct in in the wording here? I don't know why we would want to leave it ambiguous, but I think you're correct there. Yes. Chief Gowdy. So as written, um, my answer. actual thought was that it could be at either the June committee meeting or two of the regular council meetings. However, having 
heard the debate tonight, I would say it is more likely to be supported, uh, it seems like, if if there is both a pre-recorded presentations and then a dedicated council meeting. And to do that, we would need to bring back a request for decision, which we absolutely can do, to the next council meeting to add another, to add another meeting. Next time, okay. <clears throat> We can do that this evening, though, too. Somebody makes a motion accordingly. Yes, to have another meeting. Yes, that's true. So I'm going to suggest that the way that the motion is read now is kind of open ended. And if someone chooses to make an additional one to um, cause an additional meeting, then we would look at that afterwards. Fair enough? Anything additional on the motion? <clears throat> Councillor, uh, not Councillor. I'll ask our legislative coordinator to read back the motion for us, please. Certainly, Mayor Casey, uh, the council direct administration to prepare a pre-recorded presentation and allow for questions and comments from both council and the public to be received prior to council's official discussion and debate at a June council meeting. <coughs> By Councillor Hoekster. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments before we vote? Yes. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Casey, my apologies, but I'm understanding that June 1st council meeting is already booked, so that is not an option. The CEO Gowdy. So there are <coughs> items um, already planned for the June 1st meeting. I am just trying to access so I can look at the uh, agenda. Uh, we have June 1st as a committee meeting, and June 8th as a regular, and June 22nd as a regular. So my apologies for clarity then. And when it, the way it's read is add June meeting is yeah. the motion is not specific to adding hypothetically the 15th. Correct. That's right. Okay. Just want to, my apologies for trying to clear it. Anything else? <clears throat> I will call the question then. All those in favor? Any opposed? One opposed. Thank you. So noted, Councillor Ross. Okay. Councillor Hibbs. I would like to make the follow-up motion, if I might, that um, council schedule a regular council meeting, I guess, if it needs to be a decision-making meeting um, for the 15th of June, Monday. That is quite uh, what I'm First off, I would ask the administration is, uh, if, if that date is possible, for starters, if there's any other conflicts or is it for any reason that cannot be helped in, we, we, we would not be <coughs> doing ourselves any favor to vote on that now if there was some conflict or reason why we can't have it on that date. So that would be June the 15th, which is a Monday. I'm not seeing any reason why that wouldn't work to have June 15th. And I apologize, I'm on a oral laptop here, so I don't have access to my normal things, but I, I don't see any reason why June 15th would work. A special meeting uh, for this item. With a 5 p.m. So the usual. Yes. Anything additional from anyone? We all prepared to vote on that motion. Should I say, sorry, excuse me, but should I say for the purposes of the audit or does it matter? No, I think that's as understood. I will call the question then uh, as far as the 5 p.m. meeting on June 15th uh, for the waste uh, review. Solid waste review. Solid waste review. Perfect. All those in favor? And that appears to be unanimous. Thank you very much. Very ambitious getting through that in five minutes, but uh, not to worry. So we are a few moments late. It is um, time for the public hearings. And coordinator Pettibone, the, the first one then is the MDP and LUB public hearing, I assume. Correct. Uh, that's correct. Very good. 
So as mayor, then I declare the statutory public hearing for bylaws 405.1 and 400.30 open, and that this hearing is held pursuant to sections 7, 8, 230, 606, and 692 of the Municipal Government Act 2000 as amended, and request the legislative coordinator to confirm the purpose of this public hearing, that the statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the local newspaper, and that any written submissions received and not included in the public hearing agenda package are read into the record. Thank you, Mayor Creasy and Council. Uh, the purpose of this public hearing, it's the first of three tonight, uh, is to allow the general public to provide input to the proposed amending bylaws 405.1 and 400.30, given first reading April 14th. Bylaw 405.1, proposes to amend the Municipal Development Plan to allow commercial use of part of Lot P, Block 50, Plan 3583 NY at 6005 50th Avenue, and a portion of service road that's proposed to be closed. Land Use Bylaw Amendment 400.30 proposes to amend the Land Use Bylaw to rezone the same area to the C4 Hybrid Commercial District. Through Section 606 of the MGA requirements for advertising, public hearing notice was advertised as shown on page 22 of the larger council agenda in the Lacombe Express Thursday, April 30th and Thursday, May 7th. And Mayor Creasy and Council, three written submissions were received uh, subsequently have been emailed to council and I will now read those into the record. Uh, I would note that uh, they apply to all three public hearings because of the subject matter, but they'll be read here under this one because of the overarching nature of this particular public hearing. The first one is from Robbie Williamson, a Lacombe resident, and Scott Lewis. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, Scott Lewis and I, Roberta, oppose this development. We live at uh, in Lacombe. We overlook Lot P. Presently, there are already many commercial services offered to drivers as they enter or leave Lacombe past Lot P and to campers and athletes who use Missioner Park facilities or golf course. We wonder why it is necessary to add two more highway commercial parcels directly next to a park which is frequented by families and groups. This park insulated from the highway activity and noise by the strip of land that is planned to be developed is a lovely getaway within our city. If this amendment is passed, the remaining park will be negatively affected by the noise and activity of the two commercial lots. From the map provided, it appears to us that the new commercial lots will be very close to the established playground equipment. Because of the water issues in this park each spring and whenever there is heavy rainfall, a few years ago, the playground equipment was moved to its current location from a spot further south in the park. I assume the city chose this spot for relocation because it was the best spot possible within the small park. Placement of two commercial lots this close to children's play equipment is not a good idea. We also wonder who is behind this development. We assume someone has approached the town with an offer to buy these lots. The description two highway commercial parcels covers a very wide range of possibilities. Some of these possible developments would not be appropriate so close to a park and residential area. Some of them may be. Without this crucial piece of the puzzle, it's difficult for us to understand why the town would consider removing a green space, which adds to the attractiveness of this busy entrance to our city. We are cynical about this process of inviting public input. It certainly did not stop the relocation of a very popular dog park to a less than desirable spot. We assume that this amendment will pass, but we want city councillors to know that they would be making a decision which will detract from a useful and welcoming park within Lacombe and from this entrance to our city. Quiet parks used by families along with urban aesthetics should be included in the decision-making process of city councils and whenever possible count as highly as the financial reward. These are components of a simpler, healthier lifestyle that we have all been reminded of during the past few months, respectfully, Robert Williamson and Scott Lewis. The second submission is uh, from from Mr. Jin Kim, uh, sent from his wife's computer. Also has a name here, that's Siu Wen Nam. Uh, but Mr. Kim uh, says, thank you for the information. I would be, like to leave a comment regarding the proposed MDP for rezoning lot P, block 50, plan 3583 NY. Macomb Country Club in 6205 50th Avenue and our customers use the service road which was proposed to be closed with the rezoning of the lot. This will cause such inconvenience to our customers who are coming from the east side. Many customers use the service road to come to our business and also to the park. Closing this road will highly affect our business and cause inconvenience to our customers. It would be best if the service road could continue to stay open for easy access to westbound traffic. 
Although there is access through 63rd Street, normally people do not like to wait at the traffic signal when taking the left turn from 50th Avenue. People rather use the service road to come to our business, which is easier to access westbound traffic without the wait at the traffic signal. Please consider keeping the service road open. And there's some planner comments back to him uh, in terms of attaching materials. And his initial inquiry follows, which was, uh, I received a letter from Parkland Planning uh, Services regarding the proposed MDP rezoning lot P. The file number was given. I am a business owner of the nearby location that would be directly impacted. And as I was reading the letter, I would like to have better illustrations, such as where would be the car entrance, exit, parking, etc. since the proposed plan includes the closure of the service road. And uh, that was responded to with some attachments from uh, Mr. Craig Teal, uh, additional materials describing the various traffic routes that would be available. <clears throat> so the third and last response we received uh, was just before the meeting started tonight. And this is from Mr. Tyler Erb, who uh, those pre prior to were uh, opposed to the to the uh, amendments. Uh, this one is deemed to be affected. Uh, this message is regarding file number file 481. My name is Tyler Erb, and I'm a representative for the ownership at Petro Canada in Macomb. We realize that some changes are occurring down the road from us, and we had concerns about how the modifications will affect our business. We would like to request that a through road be connected to 50th Avenue where the proposed dead end would be. This would allow westbound access to the new commercial property, the Country Club Inn, as well as our Petro Canada location. This would allow access to our business from the westbound traffic, which we stand to lose traffic from due to the change to vehicle access related to the proposed service road closure. We also feel the commercial traffic would be better focused further from a residential zone. Thank you for your consideration. And these are the three submissions I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So I'm going to read the next part, which is the legislative portion of the uh, hearing, which seems a little odd, seeing as how we have no public in the room, but uh, certainly they have, the, they have the ability to phone in. Um, all persons giving oral presentations are to clearly state their name and presentations are to be brief and to the point. The order of the statutory public hearing presentation will be as follows. First off will be the development officer or a designate. Then will be those in favor and those opposed. And after that, any person deemed to be affected who wishes to be heard. I understand uh, that we have Craig Teal from the uh, Parkland Planning Agency on, online as well. Craig, are, are you with us? I am your worship. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. If you would care to um, present for the MDP and LUP portion of the public hearing. Uh, at this uh, stage, your worship, I think I'll save most of my comments for the uh, in the RFDs and for the uh, follow up decisions. Uh, just to reiterate, though, the nature of the decisions that we're going to be dealing with in all the public hearings are very much interrelated. Uh, the MDP, we're basically working our way down the hierarchy of plans. So we deal with the big policy, big picture first. Then we're moving on to the rezoning. And that leads to, depending on council's decisions on those two items, some decisions we have to make around park dedication, which will be the subject of the next public hearing. And then, of course, a formal road closure, which uh, deals with the service road. And with that comes changes to uh, access points. Uh, so without your worship, I'll uh, reserve any further uh, uh, presentation for me until after the close of the public hearing. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, and just so we have it on the record, uh, legislative coordinator Patty Bowen, do we have anyone on the line that wishes to speak in Thank favor? You. Thank you. We have uh, no parties registered online tonight. Okay. Thank you. That'll make this next part easy then. So we have none. Uh, who choose to speak in favor, none to speak opposed, and none who's, who uh, are deemed to be affected who wishes to be heard. Is that correct? Other than the red, red submissions for two opposed and one deemed to be affected, no, that, that is correct. Thank you very much. It is now 549, and I will declare the public hearing for bylaws 405.1 and 400.30 closed.
And we will move into the reserve designation. Public hearing next. And we get to do the same song and dance a few times here. So as mayor, I declare the statutory public hearing for the removal of reserve designation open at 650. Five. I'm sorry, 550. Thank you. Um, and that this uh, hearing is held pursuant to sections 7, 8, 230, 606, 674, 675, and 692 of the MGA 2000 as amended and request the legislative coordinator to confirm the purpose of this public hearing that the statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the local newspaper and that any written submissions received and not included in the public hearing agenda package are read into the record. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. The purpose of this hearing is to hear any public submissions on the removal of reserve designation for Lot P. The City of Lacombe proposes to remove Municipal Reserve uh, zoned as Community Services CS on a portion of Lot P, which is to be used to create commercial lands, which are to be zoned C4 Highway Commercial. Per Section 606 of the MGA, this public hearing was advertised. Um, as shown on page 22 again in the agenda, same advertisement in the Lacombe Express Thursday, April 30th and Thursday, May 7th. And other than the three uh, red submissions, uh, there were no further submissions received on this item. Thank you. Uh, I will once again repeat that all persons giving oral presentations are to clearly state their name and presentations are to be brief and to the point. And once again, the order will be the same as the previous uh, presentation. Development officer designate those in favor, those opposed, and any person deemed to be affected. Mr. Teal, anything you'd uh, like to add as the development officer on the reserve designation public hearing? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Nothing further to ask uh, for me to add. Thank you. Uh, Coordinator Petro, do we have anybody on the line? I can confirm no one is registered for this presentation online. Very good. Then if there's no one that chooses to speak in favor or in opposition or deems to be affected, I will declare that the public hearing for the removal of the reserve designation is now closed at 5.52 p.m. And we will move into bylaw 481 road closure public hearing. I declare the statutory public hearing for bylaw 481 open and that this hearing is held pursuant to sections 7, 8, 230, 606 and 692 of the Municipal Government Act 2000 as amended and request a legislative coordinator to confirm the purpose of this public hearing and that the subject, <clears throat> excuse me, that the statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the local newspaper and that any written submissions received and not included in the public hearing agenda package are read into the record. Uh, thank you, Mary Creasy, for this last one. Uh, the purpose of the public hearing is to allow the general public to provide input to the proposed bylaw 41 for road closure given first reading April 14th. Bylaw 41 proposes to close the portion of the service road along the north boundary of Lot P, Block 50, Plan 3583 NY at 6005 50th Avenue to allow consolidation with Lot P, Block 50, Plan 3583 NY and subsequent development. For Section 606 of the MGA requirements for advertising, public hearing notice was advertised in the same advertisement as the other prior to public hearings. And the Lacombe Express April 30th and May 7th. And other than the three written submissions already received and read into the record, two opposed, one deemed to be affected. Uh, as previously noted, there were no further submissions. And no one is waiting online. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Teal, anything you would add, like to add for the road closure portion of this of the public hearings? Uh, Your Worship, uh, nothing further from me as part of the public hearing content. Thank you. As uh, suggested by our coordinator, um, there's no one to speak in favor, in opposition, or anyone that's deemed affected who wishes to be heard at this time. So I will declare the public hearing for bylaw 481 closed at 5. 55 p.m. 
And after that much excitement, hopefully all of the people that were watching are still with us. So that concludes our public hearing portion. We can move into a request for decision then. And as ordered, uh, item number 5.1, bylaw 405.1 and 400.30, the uh, MDP and the LUB land uh, use bylaw amendments. Leonard Teal, would you care to take that item over, please? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so the first bylaw 405.1 uh, basically changes the land use concept and identifies this area for a future commercial area. That is to uh, make sure that a sub future subdivision if council so approves for commercial can be approved in that particular area. Uh, and that bylaw fortunately we're able to share the public hearing with the land use bylaw. The land use bylaw uh, 400.30 is basically following up taking from the broad concept of commercial from the MDP to say more specifically, we're going to make this area C4 highway commercial, which gives us our parcel widths, parcel size, direction, and also the range of uses that can be considered in that area. So typical highway commercial uses that are allowed in the C4 district include hotels, convenience stores, restaurants, retail, uh, convenience, uh, vehicle convenience services such as gas stations, those sort of uses. The recommendation uh, for both the MDP uh, and for the land use bylaw is for council to approve both changes. That's achieved by giving first reading <coughs> and then third reading to respective bylaws. Assuming uh, council has decided they wish to move ahead with that type of land use at this site, the uh, motion number five that's contained in your RFD and switching over to the reserve designation becomes more of a follow-up action depending on what happened with the previous two bylaws. If they were in the affirmative, then uh, council hopefully, uh, presumably would be prepared to remove the park des or reserve designation from that portion of lot P that's needed to form the commercial area. Uh, if not, then that motion number five that's in the RFD is not uh, required. Uh, with that, your worship, I'd be happy to field any questions uh, about the, these two bylaws and the reserve designation. Thank you very much. Uh, this might just be a graphical error, but on the copy that I'm looking at here, it shows the outline of the lands under question here to be in, including a small portion of the general residential lands that are currently occupied. That's on the pink outline here. Is that intentional or was that just a, an oversight? Uh, your worship, that's more of a function of the tools of drawing on top of an air photo. The residential parcel that you see to the immediate right on your screen or to the east is not intended to be part of the bylaw and the bylaw itself has a more specific exhibit that clearly follows uh, parcel uh, boundaries where they're uh, available to be followed. Very good. I hope that was the answer, but given it is shown that way, I just wanted to be sure and make sure it was on the record. Otherwise we would have a, I suspect an extremely <laughs> Angry homeowner. <clears throat> Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mary Chris. I'll move that council give second reading to bylaw 405.1. Thank you. Councillor Hitra. I guess I'm just following up with the input that the people are saying, particularly regarding the country <clears throat> inn. They they want that service road. For westbound traffic, I don't quite understand. Isn't that like? I guess you can't speak to their comments. I, I was trying to. I'm, I'm just looking at the aerial photo, and I just didn't understand. I would suggest that it sounds like people that are not interested in waiting for a traffic light can go down the service road and access the uh, 50th that way, but. Uh, so Director Thompson is familiar with their comments and can speak to them, but that, that is the comment is that um, westbound traffic, rather than going to 63rd Street at the, the lights and using the lights and then coming back east, it would be more convenient for them to stop at the entrance to the former Chamber of Commerce site and, and turn left across the two lanes there. Similarly, there may be a concern about 
vehicles leaving, but from that same um, access, currently they could legally make a move across both lanes of eastbound traffic to go westbound. Um, and this, if it was converted to a right in, right out, such a movement could only be made up 63rd Street. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Director Thompson, that by eliminating that access there and prevent people from turning left, which would be westbound, is then going across two uh, lanes of traffic. Is that precisely not what we want to do to try and increase safety of that intersection, or am I mistaken? What uh, part of our proposal and the, some of the follow-up that uh, that planner Director Teal had with the with the um, the commenter was that we would be installing a or constructing a right in right out access at the current chamber intersection, and that would prevent left turns into that interest into that access way and left turns out of that access way. It would only let right in right out movements through there, and so access to these commercial sites from westbound traffic would have to go through the signalized intersection and, and come back through the service road. And so that much safer. Right. Thank you. Councilor <clears throat> Smith. <clears throat> but to be perfectly clear, the access to zigzags or the country club in have not been cut off. Correct. As for the letter that was sent for that, to be clear, that's not the case. The, the restricted movement uh, would be that right now it is an all turns access at that location and it would become right in, right out. They would still have full access from both ways, uh, both directions of travel on, on the road. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> Councilor Hibbs? Yeah, so just another question with the feedback that we got. Um, of course, they don't have this memo when they are, you know, responding, they just get what they see in the paper, for example, or if it's online as well. So, I mean, they don't, I assume that they likely get a hold of somebody here, ask questions, ideally, and then, and then was any of their fears, um, you know, sort of downgraded once they got a chance to talk to somebody at City Hall, or was it still a concern? Director Thompson? Um, I think some of it is the last two, two of the three comments came in very late, one literally um, five minutes before council started tonight. And so uh, we haven't had a chance to, to have a conversation with those applicants, but, uh, or from those, uh, those commenters. But I think um, one thing that uh, we'll need to convey to them is that we will be um, working with the developer of those lands to develop a cross access agreement across those lands. So the intent is that anyone on that service road going east can leave out that right in, right out. And anyone who enters the, the lands through that right in, right out can pass through those two commercial lots and, have, and go west. And so by allowing that movement kind of through those, <coughs> it would, would help, um, help alleviate some of the concerns. Um, but certainly, We've only had a chance to really talk to one of those commenters. Um, Can I just have a follow up? Certainly. So I, I, just, I bring that up because I think that's important because, I mean, these are valid concerns, but they've also not really had a chance to have a proper discussion and have maybe some of those questions answered in some cases. Because I, I do understand what they're saying, because, I mean, the one says it right here, without this critical, crucial, sorry, piece of the puzzle, it's difficult for us to understand why the town would consider Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, um, and then I guess my other little comment is not really so much a question, but I do notice that in the memo you have gone ahead and done the little, you know, symbols of the two-sided arrow and the red one and the um, triangle and the sideways square or diamond, whatever. Um, while I appreciate that effort, I wonder if it's maybe too much to ask. I don't know. You tell me. Um, if something a little bit more like a little bit more of a representation of what that actually would look like could be used in the future because i mean that's difficult for i think people to read and kind of comprehend what it is actually that's being proposed for that area does that am i making myself clear um 
like I kind of struggled kind of trying to understand that. And so I can't imagine what maybe the general public is looking at. And then especially if they're maybe a little bit more emotionally invested in it because it's affecting them. Um, so I guess that would just be my comment going forward is I didn't really like that graphic and find it overly helpful. And I'd like to be able to use these tools to talk to concerned, the concerned public and be able to kind of if they haven't had a chance or aren't approaching administration and they're approaching a counselor instead, then we can at least show them that and, and sort of work through it a little bit easier. So, so yeah, forgive me for being very long winded on that, but I do think that it's helpful for us to have very clear tools, even if they're with the caveat that says this is not exactly a representation of what's going to happen, but it gives a good idea. Understood. So on that same diagram there from the <coughs> green diamond, which is a possibility for a turnaround bulb, would the road to the east of that between there and the, the yellow arrow, that would be removed then? Or is this is just a, a bulb and the road continues both ways anyway? Or would that be the termination of the road, Director Thompson? It would be the, the termination of the public portion of the road. Um, we, we left it as May um, construct a bulb out because just to leave our leave it open that it may happen. But depending on the design of the developer of these lots, our intention is to incorporate that road into what may be a part of their parking lot or a part of their access through those parcels. And a bulb might make sense depending on what we see from, from potential purchasers. Um, but our intent is to ensure the movement of vehicles through both of those lots is, is preserved. Thank you. Councilor Hoekstra. Um, thanks, Mark Creasy. Just one last question. So one concern, uh, written concern, had to do with green space or trees and whatnot. Do you think they're referring to the trees behind the inn? And if so, are those trees all going to be removed? Like, do we know any of that at this point? Or are they referring, like, I don't know what their address is. We're not privy to their address, so I can't really tell what they're commenting on. Um, so I was just curious, do we have a comment about the trees <coughs> in this area? Director Thompson. So to, to Councillor Hoekstra, the one of the lots uh, closer to, does, does include a uh, patch of the trees so the intent is to develop these lots into commercial properties and so i i can't see much of the, the new lot being preserved but certainly the developer may find interest in those and want to work around them uh, but certainly um, that is something that would likely uh, <laughs> go and um, we'd have to look at that in terms of the context of the land use bylaw as well because there are tree replacement provisions in the land use bylaw and so um, again depending on what kind of development application we get maybe a one-to-one -one replacement requirement for that developer somewhere else so we have to work through that with them but certainly a land use bylaw does speak to the removal of, of certain trees Chief Cuddy I do know which house they're at though and it is likely they're specifically concerned about the trees behind the country club inn and that those would not be impacted by this development. No additional comments, concerns? So before us, we have a motion for second reading of bylaw 405.1, I believe. That's great. Councilor, Councilor Ross made that motion, yes. Thank you. We're prepared to vote on that. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Councilor Clark. I want someone that council gave third reading to bylaw 405. <clears throat> Thank you for that. So, do we have any additional comments or concerns? Are we, we uh, satisfied that we've addressed some of the concerns of those individuals that chose to write in? Very good. I will call the 
question then. All those in favor? Seeing none opposed, that's unanimous. Thank you. Councilor Hibbs. Um, I would move that council give second reading to bylaw 400.30. Thank you. So we keep all these numbers and names straight then. This portion refers to 400.30 refers to uh, the rezoning doctor. of the, the rezoning of the lands to uh, Highway Front Commercial. Thank you. Any discussion? I'll call the question then. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Councillor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I will move that council give third third reading to bylaw 400.30. Thank you. Any additional input? All those in favor? None opposed. That's unanimous as well. Thank you. Councillor Jacobson. I am that council authorized administration to notify the registrar of land titles of the decision to remove the municipal reserve designation from all that portion of lot P reserve 150 plan 3583 NY, which lies within the plan. I don't know. Director Thompson. So the actual plan number will be inserted into the, the motion. It's a, it's a okay. sequence of thing. We will get that from, register, from land titles once we've registered it. Um, but um, but that's that's common when you send sense plans to to land titles they will give us a number that goes on our plan and that becomes the final document so that's why it's blank in the motion so it's in plan future naming or future the plan assigned by land titles plan the future assignment okay number to be assigned by land titles very good thank you councillor jacobson any concerns or with that item all those in favor Unanimous, thank you. We'll move on to 5.2 then. Bylaw 481 road closure. The formerly the chamber lands, same area that we're talking about now. And Director Thompson, are you going to do that, or is Planner Teal going to take us through that item? Planner Teal's the president. Craig, are you are you with us? I am, Your Worship. Bylaw 481, please. Yes, so definitely uh, you see overlap quite a bit in these topics. I won't yes. uh, repeat all the conversation around the access. Uh, certainly, as we did the public consultation, we do tell people about the road closure, and then uh, we did have to do a, a bit of additional information as people called in and asked some questions. So the, the road closure itself, as uh, Director uh, Thompson has indicated, means replacing the public service road with the idea of a private mutual access easement that still allows public transit or traffic and flow from east to west across probably the north part of the uh, purple area that is shown in the RFD. And uh, the conversion of the east access to a right and right out is what is going to ultimately change the traffic patterns in that area, directing more traffic up to the all points access point at uh, 63rd. So certainly all the existing businesses and the future ones will still have reasonable travel uh, access to the traveling public and their customers, although there will be change in those traffic patterns over time. Some of it a function of the uh, closure of the service road, some of it a function of the creation of the right in right out so that the uh, 50th Avenue arterial functions correctly over the long term. But with that, your worship, the recommendation is for approval by giving the second and third reading to bylaw 481. Thank you, uh, Planner Teal, appreciate that. Councillor Jacobson. I'm going to have the council give second reading to bylaw 481. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Casey. Yeah, I, I support the bylaw motion and everything. I just, I think where a lot of confusion comes in, it talks about closing the service mm -hmm. program. Where we're closing it per se, but we're rejigging it too. Like it, it's still going to be a thoroughfare. And I think that's where a lot of, I don't know how you fix that language. I don't know. You can't really, I suppose. But 
I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in. We're, we're closing it yet, or not, so to speak. Well, thank you for reminding everybody of that, Councillor Connick, because I think according to the MGA, that's kind of the wording we're left with. Yeah. But I completely agree with you. It's um, spring bounty. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so then for one, all those in favor of our second reading. Unanimous, thank you. Councillor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I'll move that council get third reading to bylaw 481. Thank you very much. Seeing no additional comment, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? And that was unanimous, I believe, as well. The third and final reading of 481. Director Pichet, you're going to come up and join us. Next up, we have um, Section 5.3 Policy Cleanup Project. Business, it seems only a short while ago we were going through some cleanup on some uh, uh, bylaws that dated back to the turn of the century. Now I expect we have a, a few project or a, a policies to clean up as well. That's exactly it. Thank you, uh, Mayor Creasy. Um, yes, before council tonight is a continuation of our record cleanup project. As you mentioned last year, we did uh, clean up over 1,000 bylaws that were inoperative, obsolete, expired, or superseded. And now we're going to continue that process in the same fashion with policies. So our records management coordinator has combed through all of the policies that are active, and I use that term very loosely. Um, she separated all the relevant and current policies from those that are obsolete, expired, or inoperative. And there's currently over a thousand policies that also need rescinding. Um, it is anticipated that we'll use the same process of breaking up the policies into uh, smaller groups. and. This time, we'll only need one motion versus the three motions as we did with bylaws. Um, if you've looked through the individual policies, you'll notice that there are some policies that look more like resolutions rather than an actual policy. And the administration of the time did register each resolution or decision as a policy. Um, therefore, the number of policies that, that um, there are grew exponentially. This also made it very difficult for direction and as the policies were not fully formed. One other item that we found as, uh, as they were going through this was the inclusion of bylaws in policies. So if you look through your list of, uh, of um, policies that are to be rescinded, you'll see some bylaws actually in there. And what that actually is, is the fact that they went through um, the bylaws they did the three readings of the bylaw, and because a resolution came out of that, that turned itself into a policy. So it's a bylaw policy combination, and what we're doing is rescinding the policy side of it. Um, we would have, if these uh, bylaws were already uh, obsolete as before, we would have already rescinded the actual bylaw. So. Um, so for tonight, administration is asking council to rescind all policies identified as inoperative, obsolete, expired, spent, superseded, or otherwise ineffective in the attached listing. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them at this point. Thank you, Director Pichet. Unlike the rest of council, I did not read each and every one of these policies. <laughs> <laughs> I did read a couple, and it, it just seemed odd to me. I was curious, was there just a different, or was the MGA different? And in in the yeah, days when a lot of these were written, or was it a different interpretation? I mean, there's a lot, some very interesting wording went out in a lot of these. Absolutely. And I think, I, I really do think it was just the, the time, the administration of the time. Uh, we have different staff now, and um, I don't believe that the MGA changed as much. Uh, we do have a modified MGA, but I don't think it's it's changed the process at all in terms of policy uh, creation. Thank you. Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mary So just to be clear then, like for example, we have council remuneration policies 2011, 2012, 2015. Yeah. I'm just assuming there's been a new one since yes. this is all three. Okay. Yeah, as, as I've gone through these myself, um, 
and, and our records management coordinator, she went through it with a fine tooth comb, but I went through as well. And I, everyone that I questioned, um, I made sure that there was a policy in place. That I'm like, that's fairly recent. So, again. And so, if anyone has any concerns with just getting rid of all of these policies, there in fact still is a copy of them that is retained uh, forever. <coughs> that is that correct? That is absolutely correct. We 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 keep these in perpetual, um, so they they will be kept in a binder. They'll just be marked as inactive, but they will always be kept as part of our records. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Hibbs. I'm prepared to make the motion, if that's okay. That council rescind all policies identified as inoperative, obsolete, expired, spent, superseded, or otherwise ineffective in the attached listing. Thank you. The expectation is no one will have a problem with getting rid of this uh, leftover administrative clutter, I guess would be the appropriate word. Uh, Councillor Hoekstra. Thanks, Mr. Creasy. I did have a question, though. What if we didn't do this? What What would be the problem if they hung around? Because there's still the print copy still here or whatever. Like, are they guiding us somehow still? Or no? Um, the majority of these policies have been basically superseded by right. another policy. They would just be sitting as excess within a, a manual. It, uh, at the end of the day, what we're wanting to achieve is having a final policy manual that we'll, we'll be able to carry on with. Um, these would just end up sitting in that manual and they would be excess. Because apparently we used to have retreats. Oh, I can <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> Anything additional? I will call the question then. All those in favor? Very good. And that one only does require the one. It only requires the one. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. There's some interesting policies in here. If you if you do look through, um, yes. there's a few that I highlighted that were uh, were. Um, Quite interesting. The extradition of Charles A is a very interesting one. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, well, there's Director Juke. I was going to say, I'm going to wait for a moment for you to join us. Welcome, Director Juke. Thank you. We've got um, item 5.5 in terms of reference for the Social Resiliency, Resiliency Task Team. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, before Council tonight is a draft in terms of reference for a Social Resiliency Task Team, as requested by Council on April 14, 2020, following a report on social services in Lacombe during the COVID-19 pandemic. As mentioned at that time, a number of Alberta municipalities, including Calgary and Stony Plain, uh, formed or were considering social resiliency task forces. Example terms of reference for those kinds of communities, for other communities, are attached to this um, RFD, as are draft terms of reference for the Combs task team. Uh, this committee would be formed by the city with an initial term of six months to be followed by a second to six month term if deemed necessary although the team is intended to be independent and self-guided. The city would, would resource the team with administrative and IT support, as well as non-voting advisors, such as the directors of community services in SCSS and the chief of police. It's important to realize that the members of this task team would not themselves be designing and delivering services, but rather the team would pool resources and expertise to research COVID-19 related community needs, advise currently active community groups and the city as to services and supports needed in the community, as well as, as well as innovative ways that we might be able to deliver those services. And the team would work to access government funding from multiple levels and coordinate services to prevent overlaps and gaps. While initially uh, there's no financial impacts anticipated to the city, council should expect that recommendations for services or funding may come forward with team reporting on a, for example, monthly basis. Uh, we'd also like to point out that administration may experience a capacity impact as existing staff would be needed to support this initiative 
and that may draw resources away from current city functions that are happening. In the month since the terms of reference were requested, the province has announced its relaunch strategy, which potentially will see Albertans return to a modified normal beginning this month. In addition, there have been no there has been no COVID-19 activity in Macomb for at least four, four weeks. If successful, the provincial relaunch over the summer months may prevent uh, the mid and long range social impacts of the pandemics anticipated by social service agencies as reported in the April 14th um, report to council. And considering this, administration would like to advise council tonight to accept this request for decision as information and hold formation of the task team on standby until such time as the relaunch strategy has advanced to some degree and we can see what the impacts will be on our community. And at that time, I'd like to accept any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Juke. Appreciate that. Any questions or concerns for Director Juke? Councillor Clark, go ahead. Thank you, Chrissy. And I'm going to assume then that the um, Chief of Police and the Executive Director of the Home FCSS are aware that they are going to be permanent members. Uh, so strike this. We can invite them, but I do not believe that we can actually assign them. We certainly couldn't assign the Executive Director of FCSS to it. And so we also have to consider their capacity and their ability to contribute to this task team. But those were suggested members as advisory. Okay, so we have your permanent advisory non voting members to the task team will include myself those, right, and those two others. And those will be suggested, yeah. I see. So they, they haven't been approached or asked. Uh, no, um, the executive director of SCSS is aware of this. Uh, she's reviewed, the, in fact, the terms of reference as well and given me some feedback on it. So she's aware that her uh, her position would be invited. And a follow up, I mean, in some Certainly. you're suggesting that we not form this task team now and just wait? <laughs> What, why would we wait? Or what's what's the rationale? Or what? You want to answer that one first, or would you care to go to Chief Gowdy? I'll defer to Chief Gowdy. Thank you. Yeah, fair question. Um, so we, I would say, when we first presented this, the picture of this pandemic was much <coughs> less clear for us, mm -hmm. and we wanted to make sure that we were giving council options to really be on the front foot and agile and ready to implement the best practices that we were seeing in other municipalities across the province. Since then, um, thankfully, the modeling that has been predicted by there, that was predicted at that time by the province has simply not come anywhere near to be the case. And we are actually recommending a more cautious approach um, that would let us focus on business continuity of some of our normal services rather than diverting uh, quite a bit of resources to this task team, which, again, thankfully, we're not seeing the overwhelming need for, which we feared we would when we first presented. Thank you for that. I, uh, I too, am thankful that we're not positioned to warrant uh, having yet another team. Uh, a little ironic that uh, we tasked administration not that long ago with uh, reducing the number of committees, boards, and commissions, and past teams, and all the rest of it, and, and uh, we're considering yet another one. I think that we've done a very good job in uh, accommodating best practices that were brought down from the province, and I just don't see a need for this at this point in time, so I hope that we're not interested in moving forward with this time. I think we've done a very a very well-established uh, network of of qualified and caring people in our community that work well together, and I don't think that another task team is going to enhance that um, at this time, anyway. As Chief Cotty said, that we're in a fortunate position now that uh, uh, certainly could change. We hope that it won't. I suppose it could, but we can. Uh, <coughs> Discuss it and worry about then if uh, if the situation warrants. Councillor Ross, thank you, Mayor Christie. Uh, I completely agree with 
all the comments made. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's uh, a lot of work moving forward to get uh, some progress as getting our economy and our household economics in good moving. So I will, uh, this is a tool that the administration has brought forward that is available to, if it's needed, but I agree with all the comments made. So I'm prepared to make the motion that council accepts this information, that accepts this report as the information. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Councillor Hibbs? No, I was going to do the same. <coughs> Very good, thank you. <coughs> Anything additional? Councillor Hooks, are you good? Very good. We will call the question there. I will call the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Very good. Thank you. Mayor Creasy. Councillor Hibbs? Could I request a recess? You certainly can. It is now a short recess. 6.30. We will reconvene at 6.40. Does that work? Yes. Very good.
Thank you. It is uh, 6 40 p.m. after a uh, short break. We are reconvening now. All things to order again. And we'll move down under request for decision to item number 5.6 the 2020 operating budget adjustments. And call upon Senior Manager Reyes to take us through this item, please. Thank you, Mayor uh, Crisi. Tonight, Tonight, Council is being presented with a request for decision to approve the 2020 spring budget adjustments as presented. Every year, the city uh, in the spring has to make uh, budget adjustments for a number of reasons. Um, in many cases, uh, there can be things that we didn't know, so we had to estimate. And now that we have new information, we have just the numbers. In 2020, one of the major reasons for uh, doing our budget adjustments is COVID-19. <laughs> My report is divided in three parts. Uh, one of them being regular budget adjustments, which is what you see every year. Uh, COVID-19 uh, budget adjustments, which is something that will only see this year, hopefully. And the last part is the utility budget adjustments. Uh, which are presented separately, mainly because those are self-sustained. Uh, I will not go over all the, the budget adjustments, but I will highlight some of the major ones. And at the end, if you have any questions about anything, uh, please let me know. So I'll start with utility budget adjustments. Uh, so there are three departments, water, wastewater, and solid waste. And because the utilities are self-sustained, any surplus and deficits uh, are covered by transfer from and to reserves. A major adjustment in, in the utilities section is under uh, the wastewater. What we, uh, we did a review uh, of the 2019 numbers, and we looked at the 2020 numbers, and we came up uh, to the conclusion that uh, user fees uh, were uh, overestimated. Uh, so we need to adjust them by 253,000 in 2020. At the same time, the amounts that we pay to the Waste uh, Water Commission uh, have been understated. And that resulted in 124,000 uh, adjustment. Going forward, uh, in future years, we'll be uh, reviewing these amounts carefully to, to ensure that we uh, that these adjustments uh, remain, uh, oh, sorry, to ensure that the estimated amounts are appropriate. The last uh, adjustment that I want to mention under utilities ha affects all three departments and it has to do with penalty fees. Uh, due to uh, the city's initiative to waive utility penalties to our residents uh, as part of COVID-19, uh, $44,000 uh, in penalty fees are being adjusted down. Uh, so therefore, uh, what we need to do in order to cover that shortfall is increase any transfers to reserves when needed. A transfer from reserves, I mean. The next uh, item that I want to, or, or area that I want to address is the regular budget adjustments. And most of these adjustments uh, have to do, as I mentioned before, new information came and we uh, make adjustments accordingly. Uh, in the case of the regular budget adjustments, most of them, or the majority of it, relates to the uh, <coughs> inclusion of the affordable housing revenue and expense. Uh, so that's, that's what you see, the major line, uh, in that there's a revenue and there's an expense. Uh, overall, regular uh, budget adjustments uh, have a favorable, favorable effect on the budget of about 190,000. Moving on to COVID-19 related budget, budget adjustments. Uh, 
as you all know, uh, we had to close uh, all city facilities uh, in order to comply with the orders from the province. And therefore, this pandemic has been having a negative effect on uh, user fee revenue and facility rentals. Um, those are the two bigger areas that have been affected. Expenses have also been affected. Uh, we have had to make new purchases of PPE, uh, counter barriers, uh, some neighborhood signage, among other expenses. At the same time, other expenses have decreased. So we, are, we have made budget adjustments accordingly, uh, and they are mainly in the areas of staffing, uh, cancellation of events such as the FCM conference, and other minor adjustments. Overall, the, uh, the uh, impact from COVID-19 related budget adjustments is 210,000 negative. When we combine the regular budget adjustments and the COVID related budget adjustments, the, the overall uh, effect is a $20,000 shortfall, which administration is recommending that be covered uh, by withdrawing funds from the operating reserve to cover that shortfall. And the recommended motion tonight is that council approves the spring budget adjustments as presented. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Senior Manager Ezra. Councilor Kodak. Thank you, Mayor Christie. I got a couple of questions. So, the inclusion of the housing grant is 381,000, but we handed out 460. So, I'm assuming we have 80,000 of our own funds somewhere else, correct? Yes, we have a capital project uh, where we have some funds in it, and that is not part of the operating budget. It's part of the capital budget, and those funds are sitting there. Okay. No, that, I just wanted to make sure that because I. <laughs> Okay. Chief Cody, you have the same thing. So the 381 is the provincial portion, which was sitting as deferred revenue, waiting for a <coughs> project to be approved. Once the project was approved, that 381 becomes recognized as revenue and is matched with approximately 79,600, I think, mm -hmm. of our own money that goes in and then is allocated to the project. So it's an in, and then there's a there's an immediate out. And that's the reason the 3D one both on both sides. Okay, no, that's fair. I just wanted to just make sure on that. My second question, um, as far as the COVID-19 numbers go, what I'm assuming there's a date that was picked. Like when you're talking about user fees for the clock center of negative $151,000, is that till September 1st? Or how did you come and arrive at that number? Is that for the whole year? So we, you're right. Um, we originally had tried to take a uniform approach with our, with our facilities and say three months of, or sorry, six months of total lost revenue and then three months of partial lost revenue. Once we started getting into our actual financial modeling and saw some of the announcements from the province, we ended up uh, selecting different dates and different periods for each facility. So you can't actually say exactly what it is. Um, which facility were you asking about? Well, I, I realize there are different dates, but uh, just, I was just curious. I, was, I guess I just, so that's my question. Did you pick the date, obviously? Yeah, yeah we, we have. The challenge is the LMC, for example, actually there's components of it that can open quite quickly as long as you're <coughs> Making sure that bookings are below the 12 um, and the 15 per sure. maximum and, and that sort of thing. Whereas the pool, they've said, well, that's not till phase three. Right. And so there does need to be, once we can start looking at it, a bit of a different approach. The other uh, thing that affects you is things like the arena, you are losing a significant, you're losing the whole summer season, but that's not really a high revenue season anyway. And so it did actually take quite a bit of detailed review of each facility for us to come up with the root, the root numbers you're seeing here, the recommended adjustments. Okay. Okay. Councillor Hoekstra. 
Um, thanks, Mercusi. I I had very similar questions too. I thought, like, what is the time period that we're dealing with with these numbers? But I I just had a comment a little bit about the document too. That in the the, the first part of the package, the numbers I didn't know if they're positive or negative. Like the re the list of um, just in your executive summary under the analysis, it says you know, the regular spring budget adjustments. I didn't understand, is that to the good or to the bad in terms of revenue? I, I would love, like, I like the charts. That explains it well to me, but I wouldn't mind if that was a bit clearer in the future. But thank you for the chart, because it it made more sense than what we're doing. Um, but I just, one more time, wastewater services. We are, I, I, we are truly transferring almost four hundred thousand dollars from reserves for this. Is that just to to balance the budget? Uh, yes. Just for twenty twenty. For twenty twenty. Yes. Okay. I just I know I'm stating a very negative number, but I, I th thought. And then, as your go forward plan, you were saying the budget will be adjusted accordingly to ensure that that won't necessarily happen to that degree again that they're that is correct for 2021 we will be uh, looking at, at those numbers and we are going to ensure that we have more reasonable numbers uh, so that we don't see this problem from recurring but our reserve is fairly healthy at this point too though right uh, uh isn't it a two million yeah. Um, I don't remember the exact balance. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's one, close to 1.5. We'll get the exact balance on the back to okay. Anyone else? Councilor Carter? Thank you, Mayor The only, it's not a question per se, it's just more of a comment. Given that you have established certain dates for buildings and so forth, there is still a chance that there could be expenses or revenue shortfalls that we haven't foreseen yet. Okay, and I just wanted to reiterate, and I've said it before already, even things like police, we're not sure. I talked to the chief this morning, things are looking good. Like for example, in April, they hardly wrote any speeding tickets because who was on the road? Nobody, almost. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's all I'm putting out to that. And that's not the non just police. There could be other things we haven't foreseen in other departments. Okay, that's all I want to be clear about. You got it? Yes, I, I want to reiterate that point, actually, that these are our best estimates. And, and we, I think we've done a pretty good job, actually. We're pretty confident in what we've gone through. Um, but absolutely, there, there will be unforeseen costs, and there may be unforeseen savings that we realize in other areas. So we're, we're fairly confident. We're happy to see that number, the withdrawal requirement fairly low right now um, at, at $20,000. Unfortunately, we, through modest surpluses in the past few years, we have room available, even if there is some unforeseen expenses. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a little unrealistic to expect them to be nailed down to a, to a fine point at this stage of the game, given that we haven't even we, we really don't know from the province when, in fact, we will be able to open some of these facilities. Uh, ones that were mentioned earlier, I mean, as far as internal stuff, fine. Uh, the LMC, some possibilities there, the library and the coffee shop and areas like that can open, but recreation facility, that's a whole other ballgame until we get through the uh, phase two. Uh, phase three is still very much a guess. And, and further, there's also a chance, albeit I don't know if it's slim or not, that we could see some funding from the federal government or the province for municipalities too. I mean, we haven't seen it yet. I know big, big cities, of course, are really behind the eight ball, but I think I know it's slim. So, so um, I, I guess I suspect there will be some funds available. We were um, we were accounting for all the costs related to COVID separately, so that we do have that uh, available. And the province has asked us to make sure we're specifically allocating costs related to 
the emergency coordination center um, for those communities that have activated it, like ourselves. Um, they've indicated that there may be some cost recovery that, they, that we can get access there. Um, I have heard a lot about the cash flow issues that other municipalities appear to be facing. And I, I, when I look at our own finances, thankfully we made decisions fairly quickly and those aren't, those, those perceived issues are not issues that I would say we face here at the city. Councilor Connick. Well, I can make the motion that the council approve the spring budget amendments as presented. Thank you. Any additional input from anyone? And we'll call the question then. All those in favor? That was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Well, you're on a roll there, uh, Senior Manager Reyes. If we progress to the item number 5.7, the bylaw 479 2020 tax rate bylaw, please. Thank you, Mayor Crisi. For council consideration tonight is a request for decision with a recommendation to give first reading to uh, the 2020 property tax bylaw, bylaw 479. Um, this item is related to the budget adjustments. Uh, so when we uh, calculated the mill rates uh, for 2020, we took into account uh, the budget adjustments that you just approved. Now, I will be highlighting a few items in my report. Uh, Number one, uh, I want to mention that uh, the assessment values uh, that, that are used to arrive to, to this bylaw are based on the 2019 assessment. Uh, number two, uh, by uh, passing this bylaw, uh, the city will be able to levy taxes for its municipal needs, as well as uh, for education taxes on behalf of the province and as well as uh, for the Com Foundation. <clears throat> One thing that I want to mention about uh, the assessment is residential assessment went down by around 1.1% when compared to the prior year. And non-residential assessment went up slightly 0.4%. So the overall uh, assessment went down by 0.5%, so basically flat, uh, just a slightly down. Um, and what, it, what, what this does is um, it affects uh, the mill rate, uh, but it doesn't uh, have a big impact in this case because it's, uh, it's a small decrease. But basically it would do the opposite uh, to the mill rate, it increases the mill rate. In 2020, uh, non-residential rate uh, remains unchanged at 112 percent uh, of residential taxes, and uh, this is below the target rate, which is 120 uh, percent. The total municipal tax in 2020 is uh, approximate uh, is approximately 14 million 968 which is um, it's slightly higher than in prior year, uh, mainly because of the 1% increase that you approved back in, in the fall, and some, some growth that is also factored in that number. The education property tax, uh, on the other hand, went down. It's sitting slightly below 5 million. And this number is actually lower than in the prior year, 
as you may remember in the prior year, uh, at this time of the year, we didn't know what the actual uh, education tax requisition will be. So we had to estimate. And we ended up estimating it slightly higher uh, so that overlay had been factored in 2020. And that's partly why the number that you see is lower. But there is also another component uh, that makes it uh, lower. Uh, requisitions from the province are actually lower this year than they were in, in 2019. And as you may recall, the province uh, said that they would maintain the same, uh, the same uh, requisition. But as when they say that, it's, it's the total requisition across the province. And so therefore, some municipalities will see lower payments and some will see slightly higher payments. But at the end, at the, end uh, the province will collect the same. So that results in a lower lower mill rate for residents uh, when it comes to the education portion. Overall, uh, residents will not see much of a much of a change in their property taxes. It will be slightly down. I would say that in most cases they'll see it the same way, flat. So equivalent to a zero percent increase. And with that, I'm open to any questions that council may have. Uh, and again, the motion is to give it first reading to bylaw 479. Thank you, Senior Manager Reyes. Councilor Extra. I'll make that motion that council give first reading to bylaw 479. Thank you. Any clarification required? Of course, it's first reading, so no discussion, but clarification is fine if there is any. Seeing none, I will call the question that all those in favor of bylaw 479 first reading. And that was unanimous, I believe. None opposed? Thank you. Anybody interested in entertaining second reading at this particular time or no? Councillor Jacobson. Oh, sorry. I have my hand raised for something. Okay. Go ahead. Very reaction. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Seeing uh, no one interested in that, we will move on from uh, 5.7 and move into uh, notices of motion from last time. Item number 5.8, a spending motion rate. Eight. No worries. A uh, spending motion relating to public works uh, brought forward by Councillor Ross. Would you care to uh, re or read your uh, motion, please? So I'm go back to start here. <coughs> My apologies. <coughs> Excuse me. In light of the current pandemic and possible changes to provincial funding, to halt further spending on the public works building until quarter three, 2020, with the expectation that future financial position of the city will be more certain at that time. Thank you. Very open discussion. Chief Cody. So just uh, in terms of context, I can confirm that at this time, we don't have any um, contracts in place or RFPs out for design um, or any site work for the facility. So I would say just to, just sort of to inform your uh, vote tonight, I can confirm that we don't really have any plans to make any expenditures until quarter three as as it stands today on this project. Thank you. Councillor Ustra. So I, I have a question around clarification because I wondered whether it was this building or is this you're proposing regarding the new building? There was no land prep of the new building. Okay. <coughs> that, was that was for approximately I thought maybe hours. we had, were doing some big fix up here yet that okay, just thought the public needs to know that too. Absolutely. 
Councilor Cuddock. So in light of what you just said, then this, what's the point of this motion? Like you're saying, the money's going to get spent till quarter three anyways? Or? That was just as information, though. Yes, that's just as information. I guess uh, this, the, there is $1 million in the 2020 capital project for which administration is approved to, to spend money on. Okay, okay. Um, just to let you know, I guess, as I, to let you know, we're not, you know, currently, and that's not in our work plan right now for quarter two, so we wouldn't plan any significant expenditures until quarter three. Okay. Well, Walker, sorry. I just, I, I still support the new public works building site. I would hope that the work continues on that. So I, I guess I'm not supporting this motion, I guess. Um, because I think that's important and needs to continue. Councilor Ross? Uh, I guess my, we have already, things have happened with the uh, past administration. CEO Gowdy was, uh, I <clears throat> did excellent work in negotiations that we have had land swaps that have taken place since the budget last fall. So we already have, we no longer own Opsil in the fire hall. A fire review study is being done. We would be leasing the building back, which I think we've already done some, the roof repairs had to be done. There were some uh, more appropriate restroom renovations done. That was to a tune of 180,000 or so, if I remember correctly, if I remember. 300,000. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just not corrected. Anyways, so I just think it's uh, maybe a quarter three when it comes to council, there'll be, we'll probably know more of what are our RFPs for this upcoming uh, expenditures or RFPs that were put out throughout the city projects. I think they will be uh, quite positive with how far are the money will be going this year that may possibly make some changes to the projects. I just I uh, spend a million dollars that might not the building might not happen for years down the road. I just uh, I guess I'm not in favor of spending a million dollars just on prep work when we don't have, to have a de definitive date moving forward on new public works building. So. Fair enough. I, um, I think your point is well taken. I guess the issue that I have with it is that we, if you um, refer to the um, later on in our agenda package, there was uh, an item there for the items that were brought forward to the province for uh, capital spending, one of which is that building. And I'd, I just don't think that I would necessarily send the proper message to the province about our participation in a project that on one hand we're asking uh, to be uh, put on the fast track, but yeah, we're not willing to spend anything on it until later on. I just, I think that sends a very difficult message, one that I'm certainly not prepared to uh, support at this particular time. Um, I do, however, appreciate uh, the reason why this motion was brought forward and um, I too can suggest that there's no plans at this time for any major expenditures anyway. I would just hate for it to hamper um, us in the short term if we did have to change that to accommodate uh, uh, funds coming from the province or, or federal funds as well. Councilor Ross? Uh, I respect that. Just from my understanding, the amount of the lease for to lease back the current fire hall with debt service approximately two million dollars, and then therefore, then obviously that we project be cost shared with the county when there's a fire review being done. I just, I different priorities, I guess, and that's a matter of opinion. So it's that's just a. Okay, but the anyways, motions for the public works. Exactly. Yes, I don't exactly, but if that money is not spent on that with the prep, then. Could that obviously be used elsewhere? <clears throat> okay. Very good. So, any additional questions or comments? We do have a motion on the floor that was uh, read into the record uh, by Councillor Ross. Five point eight. I would ask that it uh, be reread, unless someone wishes it to be. 
Anything additional before we vote? I will call the question in. All those in favor? And those opposed? That is uh, opposed and noted accordingly. That does complete the request for decision portion of our agenda. And we'll move into the information uh, section. The first one, 61.A, our Chief Administrative Officer's report. If you would care to enlighten us on what you've got to do as well. Thank you. City Hall, uh, so I'm going to go through the COVID-19 updates first. Uh, the Emergency Coordination Center remains active, although we have scaled back our frequency of meetings, uh, as has the Provincial Operations Center. We currently have no active cases at the time of writing this report, but also today we still have no active case, cases. City Hall and Public Works uh, will be open to the public May 19th. I have confirmed with uh, the police chief that the police station will also be open on May 19th. It actually remains open with some modifications uh, yeah, uh, right now. Um, so that will be a nice return. Um, we are also seeing some of our full-time long-term staff return, although most casuals and part-time <coughs> staff do remain on temporary layoffs <coughs> and are associated with specific facilities, which unfortunately we can't uh, open yet. And so no dates have been provided for the Gary Moe Auto Group Sports Plaques, the Kinsman Aquatic Center, or the Mary Seymour Public Library. We have uh, made the decision to cancel all programs and facilities until the end of May, or facility bookings, I should say, until the end of May. Um, and I think that is likely to happen for June as well, but we've held off on that decision as of yet. Staff continue to be on modified shifts to minimize the risk for critical service interruptions. And we have no administrative recommendations for the declaration of the state of local emergency at this time. The government of Alberta has created a critical staff registry um, to identify staff associated with essential services um, to make sure they're prioritized for testing um, and just so they have a registry, I guess. All of our critical staff and firefighters have been registered on that uh, program. Is there any uh, elected personnel on that list? Uh, no. Yes, I believe the chief elected uh, official is allowed to be on that list, uh, and so okay. we have we have included that. I didn't want to make light of it. Just, I, didn't, I actually didn't think that any elected people were considered critical. I, I, I think we might actually have a deputy there also, but I can't get to that. And beyond that, uh, I guess I would ask if there's any questions first uh, about the COVID response. Councilor Connick. So the temporary staff that have been laid off are an example from the pool. Are we confident that when we do eventually reopen, those people will still be around? Like, have you got a sense that they're looking for new work? I mean, they can't be off work forever either. I'm just a fear that we're going to reopen and we don't have any. Why do you mean? That is not a fear that I share. Okay, good. I would, I would say that, that has been considered. Um, that may occur for a very select number, but for the majority, they will be thrilled to be back at work uh, in their chosen profession. <laughs> and there, there isn't a lot of, a lot of other options for them right now. All right, well, that's true. But yes, then I, I expect we'll lose a a small fraction of our staff to other opportunities. We're confident we'll have the staff to go through. Councilor Hoekstra? I just have a comment regarding um, the barrier that's been created. That's not the right word for the front staff here in the City Hall. It looks excellent. Like in some ways, you think maybe it should have always been there. Just saying. It does look good. Um, we have partnered with a local contractor to. Do that here and at a few of our other facilities, and we're happy on this. That's great. Yeah, in for safety. Because it, in some places it's been not done classy. This is very classy. Well done. And so, further the core customer comments, that is in place at the pool too now. I mean, obviously, the pool is open, but will it be? 
Uh, there like will, yes, there will be something in place. I'm not actually sure that it is in place right now. No, I think that that's our second. That's giving me a look like maybe it is. Is it? Oh, okay. It, it may be. It, there is plans to put okay. it. Okay. No, sure. Anything else? Continue on. That's that's all I have. Oh, so I'm going to go through the capital projects for your hand. I'm sorry. Um, we did, sorry, yes, we did submit, um, we summarized and submitted uh, some capital project priorities for the municipality for st uh, stimulus spending, if there is some. Um, and so we submitted those both provincially and federally, and we also actually completed some light applications for the Investing in Canada's infrastructure program and submitted those as well. So, it's, so if there is infrastructure stimulus spending, the city of Macomb will be well positioned. We've definitely made our requests and they are well supported and, and align well with the province's objectives. It's just a matter of whether they go ahead with that. So how would you know? Unknown, but they haven't given any dates. Councilor Connick? So that list you submitted, I see it attached here. How did you arrive at that list? You must have shortlisted because, for example, we do had mentioned um, paving of Lynn Thompson Drive. Yeah, I don't see it on here. To be honest, I would have liked to have seen it on here, but it's not. Yeah, I think it is. It is uh, it, it's just rather than specifically calling it paving of Lynn Thompson Drive because we're worried that the reviewer wouldn't know the significance of Lynn Thompson Drive. It, that is the commercial sector service road uh, construction project. And so we tried to highlight how there is an economic impact to that project uh, that would support industry in the city. Okay, no, that, thank you for that. Because when I read that, commercial sector service road construction, it didn't sound like it was that area. So what you're saying is included in that? No, I'm sorry, that is incorrect. That is, uh, that, I'm sorry, Councillor Connick. Uh, the commercial sector service road reconstruction is the extension of paving of the, the service, service, road. service road. Right. Director Thompson, can Active you transportation upgrade? remind me about the um, Len Thompson and where that lies? I believe it was a phase two or a level tier two, and why we need it. Uh, Thank you, SEO guy. I think primarily because we wanted to display a spectrum of projects for both road work, building projects, um, recreation projects, so that we had to the reviewer the best chance of having a portfolio of projects that could um, uh, be ready for, for funding. And um, and Len Thompson Drive was one of those projects that would have weighted more heavily on the road construction side. Good. Sure. Uh, and um, sorry, I, I remembered now. We are also finalizing our local improvement levy framework, which was uh, council direction. And with that being a portion of the funding that anticipated to be on Thompson, we didn't think we'd be as tender ready as we would like to be with that particular project because we would still have to go through that public exercise. I'm sorry about my first error response. Okay. Satisfied with oh, that explanation? I'm satisfied with the explanation. I'm not. No, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Satisfied. 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 Okay. Thank you. Very good. Councilor Ustra. Um, thank you for having Lacombe Seniors Lodge on here. And I highlighted that today at the Lacombe Foundation meeting. But I was quick to be told later on that that is only phase one. Is the city aware of that? Um, that, what did it, what? The words were that's phase one, so this would be the money that was needed just to replace Parkview Manor, so not the lodge. So just that people are, are aware that the Lacombe Seniors Lodge is actually a $45 million project, not 12. So that we're not misled that this is. Yes, so this is phase one. It doesn't include the true building of the lodge and the demolition of the two buildings. So. So after much discussion with this between the CEO and myself, I was perhaps a little 
badgering about getting it done, feeling that it was important that these options be put forth before the provincial government for consideration rather than having them all, having it perfect, so to speak. And then this document showed up and I got to tell you, I was very impressed with mm -hmm. not only the content, but the look of it, other than the choice of photos <laughs> is a little questionable, but really overall, I mean, it, it really does look good. And I, I can't help but imagine that uh, whomever the, the, the uh, team is that is tasked with looking through literally thousands of projects, that this will not stand out, mm -hmm. this entire package. So job well done, please uh, portray that to the team that was responsible for this as well. Thank you. Anything on the online aggregation of community events you wanted to touch on or? No, uh, just with the new website, that's one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the opportunities we see is to build on Macomb's presence as a regional tourism hub. And um, I think having our site focus on some of the community events that are happening in the, in the community is something that's going to just be a great opportunity coming out of both the COVID damper on any events mm -hmm. and the new website that we're hoping to, uh, to launch in the end of summer here. And regional wastewater or no? There we are working with uh, Lacombe County and the city of Red Deer to, uh, and Alberta Environment to add any global facility onto the regional sewer system. And um, it is a little more regulatorily involved than we were originally led to believe or would like, but we're working through it. It is a uh, I think we're tasked with updating six water and wastewater licenses concurrently to switch some things around. So it is quite a bit of work, but we'll, we'll get there. Thank you, Chief Gotti. Um, so I guess by default, we kind of went through A and B, this shovel ready projects as well. Is there any question or follow up on either? The report or the shovel ready projects? Councillor Jacobson? Yeah, I had a question. Could you just outline what the benefit is to us at all for having the any global site connected to the water line? Uh, certainly, serving on that commission, I would suggest that um, the current utilization of that entire line is uh, well below capacity. And any time that we can add on uh, additional uh, users within the service geography that's outlined, which is what happens to be within the county of, of, of Lacombe, uh, I think is a good thing and uh, in theory should help reduce the overall costs somewhat to um, the, the three communities that that uh, foot the bill for the operation of it. Is that a fair? Yeah, that's, um, there, there's some fixed overhead costs associated with this utility. And so spreading them out over a higher number of, a higher volume of sales means a slightly lower unit rate, uh, each, but, but very slightly. Uh, when you're getting this amount of volume, it's a small impact to existing rate payers, but a positive one. I suppose a person could perhaps, or some may consider the benefit to know that uh, uh, all trees effluent that is uh, originating from a watershed and being returned there goes through um, really what is a central facility so that the quality uh, of that uh, effluent water being returned is of a certain standard and not left to quite as many different organizations to look after. So a little bit of efficiency for the government and what ought to be peace of mind for area residents knowing that uh, that those waters that are going back to the, or return to the Red Deer River are, are uh, uh, treated properly. Not to suggest that they haven't been in the past, but uh, this is just one, one more level of oversight. So I, I guess I would also say ME Global, <clears throat> excuse me, is a large employer of Lacombe residents. 
And so allowing them to focus on their core petrochemical business and not on the wastewater treatment is something that's very desirable for that business and that business's success drives success in, in the Macomb area. So that partnership has a lot of value. Anything else? Very good. We'll move on to 6.2, the council mailbox. Is there any questions on either of the FCSS related letters uh, from the government of Alberta on April 14th and 17th? And the memo for seniors and housing from April 24th, any questions or concerns with it? And we had a letter uh, regarding position funding from our AUMA president, uh, Barry Morishita, mayor of the city of Brooks uh, from April 29th. You have some comments on that, uh, well, Councillor? Indirectly, uh, I confess that a lot of the emails that I kind of just deleted, I confess, but um, as far as we know, that AMA is still happening in fall so far. Thank you. Calgary. Calgary. So they're there. So that I did receive a uh, notification from them today, an invitation to a survey um, where they're asking that very question of whether they think people would be comfortable attending or whether they should do a virtual thing or have just limited to one person per municipality attending so they can keep the to 50 delegates. Um, and so I think that's very much up in the air, whether it's, uh, to be honest, it's very hard for me to imagine that a bunch of central region delegates are gonna wanna go to Calgary, for example, or host the whole province in the central region. So I, I think it's very much up in the air of how that's being delivered. And finally, there was a Alberta government memo for seniors and housing again on the May 1st. Any questions with that letter? We have no uh, commission board and committee reports and minutes <coughs> that were submitted uh, to be included in this particular agenda. Council reports. I do not have one at this time. Councillor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Tracy. I only had one meeting that I attended, and it was the uh, library board meeting, and they reviewed the financial audited financial statement from BDO, and uh, things are looking pretty good for the library. They're uh, doing quite well on that end of it. There didn't seem to be too many issues. When a discussion was held regarding the reopening of the library and what measures would have to take place. And being that libraries are in phase two, uh, our next meeting, I think we're gonna do a walk through of the library and, and make sure that you know we're in a position to request any of the needed signage or arrows or whatever we need to do to facilitate the opening uh, that will be coming in the very near future. So that'll be our, our next meeting. And the librarian is, it's a good thing we're opening because things are winding down for her. All the books have been returned. We can't get books from Parkland Regional. There's a number of things that are, so it's slowing down a little bit for her, but she's looking forward to getting ready for the reopening. So I'm open to any questions. Thanks, Councillor. Chief Cuddy, would it be appropriate to have our health and safety person be available for that walk through the library? That's a suggestion if you still wish, anyway. Thank you. Councillor Cotter? Uh, I don't know. I don't believe Councillor Cotter can answer this, but maybe he can. Things like if the library is required to have PPE, is, is the assumption made that the province will provide that? Or are the libraries supposed to get it on their own if that becomes a mandate that when they open, they've got to have masks or whatever? Um, so they won't, I guess, is the short answer. I, I'm not sure what, if there was a requirement for PPE or things like libraries. 
I believe the province would not allow them to open right now. No, 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 but when they do in phase two, and they say, okay, everyone, and all staff has to wear a mask. Is it up to the library to provide that or the province? Or we don't know. Uh, nobody will say they have to wear masks. They will not, that will not be a, that will not be a thing. They just open. Yeah, well, they, so the province has released guidelines on, on PPE use for various uh, workers, whether it's frontline workers, firefighters, police officers, retail staff workers. And I, I can say unequivocally, the library will not be required. Librarians will not be required to be wearing masks. Uh, that's just not in there. If they changed those guidelines, I don't know. That's the short answer. And then yeah. the province has, has purchased and, and has bulk ordered for like our fire department and police station. The ordering has been fairly haphazard. Um, and so we actually have had to source our own private PPE to meet the needs of our own agencies. So I think even if they were to offer that, I, I, I can't see it being a priority where they would be able to meet it because they're not meeting the emergency services mm -hmm. needs right now. Councillor Ross, anything to report? No. Thank you. Councillor Hoekstra? Yes, you have my report in front of you. Um, I'm becoming very attached to my computer, but anyhow, all of this is online. I, I think the thing that I wanted to highlight for sure was the Regional Emergency Management Partnership uh, Advisory Committee. We have a very good region, and I think regional partnership um, for emergency management. And, and I think that's reflected in a lot of our regional partnerships when we talk about wastewater and all this stuff. Our area of the province works really well together and that was highlighted at that meeting that um, we're an area that is ready to step up and do more things together. And, and so that was good to, to be part of. Um, the Chamber and the ECHO Foundation is part of BLEEP and we were invited as Chamber um, board members to be part of BLEEP, which was the Lacombe Economic Action Partnership. And we, so I sat in on that, listening to some of what businesses in town are feeling during this, um, dealing with the pandemic. And um, I think I didn't bring it up in great detail tonight, but the question that I got out of that is, are we doing enough for our businesses in the city? Because, deferring payments or taking away penalties. Um, it didn't seem like it was enough, but I, I think in reality, we're gonna be dealing with more of that in 2021. And so um, I didn't bring up that tonight. Um, yeah, lots of the rest of it you can see there. Uh, I attended the interagency meeting. There's still lots going on in town, but yeah. If you have any questions. Councilor Connick. I don't know if it came up or not in your chamber meetings, but they still intend on relocating to the Oklahoma County. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We didn't have quorum, Councilor Connick. I see that in your Yeah, unfortunately. So a lot of we were just talking. Yes, the move is for sure. They were talking about where the signs going, that sort of thing. But you know, it is it is for real. But again, they're being hit again because of the trade show being gone. That's a, was a big revenue generator for them. So. Um, they have to look at different ways of working with their budget. So I'm just kidding. Oh, Chief Gowdy, go ahead. You had a question or a note in here of can the city buy bulk of PPE equipment right. for small businesses? And so that kind of actually ties into Councilor Connick's question because we were looking at this very thing of who will need it and can we provide it? Um, we actually talked specifically to the Provincial Operations Center about this very thing of whether we could bulk purchase and they said, no, we won't, we won't do that because we're not even meeting the needs of our emergency responders uh, fully right now. However, uh, they did follow up with some information about private suppliers of PPE that uh, could supply businesses. And I know that uh, our economic development officer has been talking with some of our businesses about making sure they know about that avenue and seeing if there's an opportunity for us to coordinate some bulk purchasing. It just won't be through the province and and they did tell us quite quite bluntly there won't be requirements for a significant PPE for 
for retail workers and, and that sort of frontside compliance service workers. Thank you for noticing that question, but yes, it was the idea is to, to save money for sure too. Councilor yeah. Rickshaw, so in your report that I noticed you outlined through the Coma FCSS that there were some 500 meals that were distributed, frozen meals rather, distributed for the month of April. That seems to be a significant increase from the Meals on Wheels program. Yes. And I was just wondering, uh, what's the... It, it's about a 100% increase, if that's what you were curious about. Mm -hmm. And I, because I, I wanted to have the other number of what Meals on Wheels, and we, I didn't get it before today because I was struck by that stat too. Um, but what's happening now is that because people can't, or restaurants like there's it's it's not your typical meals on wheels family and that's not the right way to put it but yeah it has expanded people who who typically would have gone somewhere else for a meal now get a frozen meal so um and the, but this also could be pre-buy right if i'm gonna have if i need 30 meals well, maybe that's too high 10 meals in april i'll actually order 20 because then i've got enough for april and may so it's not necessarily representative of of what's going to happen in the months to come. But there is no Meals on Wheels being delivered right now. No, no, no there's no That is it. That is it, sorry, yeah, yes, if I misunderstood. Yeah. yeah, there are no Meals on Wheels, which is a bit unusual because Red Deer is still doing Meals on Wheels. So, but um, this was a decision a bit by the Lacombe Lodge. They were, the, because our meals are sourced, our Meals on Wheels program is sourced from Lacombe Lodge, um, they they were feeling that they could not maintain the program plus deal with what the risks. what yeah what they were doing at the lodge so the risks and potentially having to be short staffed and whatnot meals on wheels are very successful in Macomb. Councilor Connor, just on kind of the same topic, but I was talking to somebody who was involved with the food bank and there the usage is way down at the food bank for whatever reason, or was the last one. Yeah, I had an opportunity to try by there on a, on a food donation run from an individual from British Columbia who had helped a load along with uh, Councillor Ross and Dead Director Juke who showed up actually to help, which was an extremely nice and generous donation. Um, and the director there suggested that very thing that their usage was in fact uh, down, she said rather significantly. Uh, I think she felt that perhaps either people were, were a little informed as they were still operating for what the hours were, or perhaps some fear about attending the uh, facility as well. So I expect that that will change when the public realizes that in fact they have been um, open for use. Um, some of the protocols have changed. You have to call in first, or um, maybe they, they arrange for delivery, or whatever the, the case may be. Um, but in fact, they are still fully up. They are still operational. Mm -hmm. I just have an initial comment. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I mean, there is some money flowing as well that are available to people that need it if they've been laid off as short term as well. So just because a demand might be low right now doesn't mean it won't be very soon here because, yeah, like the CR, CERB sure. will dry up, um, you know, things like that. So if people aren't able to get back to work right away, then we could see a, a different look. Councillor Jacobson, did you have a report? Councillor Gibbs? Councillor Connick? Councillor. Very good. I think that that is uh, all there is for the information portion. Somebody will care to make a motion? To accept as information. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's any additional comments. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. From April 27th, our regular council meeting minutes. We had an opportunity to review those. Any inconsistencies or revisions you'd like, uh, Councillor Hoekstra? I move we accept the minutes as presented. Thank you. 
Does anyone have any thing? Very good. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. No notices of motion this evening. And uh, we do have uh, some in-camera items to go through uh, later on. And as far as our next meetings, Monday, May 25th is a regular council meeting here. And then June 1st is scheduled as a council committee meeting, which will still go forward. And then Monday, June 8th is our regular council meeting. And then we have a special council meeting on June 15th, correct? correct? You can add that in your calendars as well. So regular, regular council meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Regular council, thank you for that correction. He's still there. <laughs> That's right. Big brother is watching. <laughs> So that's really all of the items that we have uh, for uh, public consumption this evening. If anybody would care to make a motion for your camera at this time. Councilor Extra moves that we go in camera at 7.40. All those in favor? In camera we are. <laughs> 